Hi, this is Chase Thompson, pastor of First Baptist Church of Central City, and we are so glad that you are streaming this sermon today. We provide these sermons online so that you can have the opportunity to hear and be reminded of God's Word at any time. We also hope these sermons will provide an opportunity for you to share the message of Jesus with others. Basically, we hope these sermons will build you up and lead others to know Jesus. That being the case, please know that our prayer for you is that you would be plugged in and involved in a local church. God calls us to be a part of a local body of believers under the care and leadership of local pastors. These sermons cannot replace that. So if you don't have a church home, we would invite you to come and be with us at any time. At First Baptist Church of Central City, we would love to have you. And thank you again for tuning in. May the Lord be with you. Bibles to Psalm 8. If you have your Bibles, if not, we have that on the screen, Psalm 8. And as you flip there, I want to ask you this morning, have any of you ever seen something so beautiful that it reminded you very simply of the majesty of God? Raise your hand if you've seen something so beautiful it reminded you of God's majesty. Yeah. How about have you ever experienced something so wonderful that it reminded you of how good God has been to you personally? Yeah, I've experienced those things. I feel like I was experiencing that just now as we worship together. Uh, for many people, also, it's the beach. They go to the beach and they see the vastness of the ocean and they think of the majesty of God. Uh, for many people, it's the mountains. We just got back from the mountains a couple of weeks ago and uh, the first night, I could not sleep well at all. I got it in my head. I was convinced that the bed had bed bugs, right? You ever been like that before? And it didn't. It didn't, but I just itched all night, and finally I woke up at 3 o'clock, and I just got up, and I went and I took the hottest shower I possibly could. I'm still thinking about bed bugs. Again, no bed bugs, thankfully. But I got up, and by 3.30, I was sitting all by myself at the dinner table. I was dressed. I had my Bible. I had my prayer journal, and I just spent that time with the Lord. And as the light began to come up over the mountains, I could see the outline of the mountains, and I was reminded of the majesty of our Lord and how good He is. Uh, how many of you remember the total eclipse we had in 2017? Did anybody go to Hopkinsville for that? Raise your hand up if you went to Hopkinsville. Yeah, a few people. We went. Our family went and got to enjoy that and see all the darkness. And then in the middle of the day, you looked up and you could see the stars in the sky right in the middle of the day, reminded of God's goodness and His majesty. How many of you like to just go out on a clear night and look up at the stars? Anybody? Yeah, that's beautiful. Beautiful. Uh, what we find in Psalm 8, this is a psalm of praise, and one commentator calls this a psalm for stargazers. Because the context, as you read it, seems like the psalmist, it was possibly King David, just wandered out at night one evening and looked up at the stars and wrote a hymn of praise to the Lord, reflecting on God's majesty. So again, this is a psalm of praise, and it's also a psalm that raises some pretty big questions for us, questions about life and the meaning of life and our purpose in the universe, the biggest of which being, where does our worth come from? How are we worth anything in this great universe? And the question we're going to be asking this morning very simply is this, why are you valuable? Why are you valuable? What makes you worthy of love and dignity and life? How do we have any worth at all? Those are the questions we're asking as we look now to Psalm 8. And I want to invite you to stand with me in honor of the reading of God's Word. Psalm 8, beginning in verse 1. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings. And crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. All sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field. The birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea. Whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O oh Lord, our Lord. How majestic is your name in all the earth. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, we thank you for this, your word, and Lord, we thank you for this time that we have together now as a congregation to hear your message. And Lord, I pray that you would speak to us plainly today. 
God, I pray that you would help me not to be a distraction to your message, but rather, Lord, I humbly ask that you would speak through me. Lord, I pray that you would work in our hearts and in our lives to bring us closer to Jesus Christ through this time in your word. Lord, convict us of our sins that we need to repent of and draw us into a greater holiness in Jesus Christ. God, remind us this morning of our worth and where it can be found. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Again, the psalm begins with a word of praise in verse 1. It says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. And notice there's a personal nature there. He's not just the Lord. He's not just, O Lord, he is our Lord. And so this is written by someone who knows the goodness of God, someone who has experienced his grace and his salvation, someone who has been provided for by this great God that we serve. And he's speaking to the majesty of God's name. And he says, all of creation testifies to your majesty. All of creation paints a picture of how good our God is. Even if there are many of mankind who do not know who do not recognize the majesty of God, still the whole earth is filled with his glory. And he begins in verse 2, this is a psalm of praise, to list the reasons for praise. Look again at verse 2. He says, Out of the mouth of babies and infants you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. A lot of people have had a hard time understanding this verse and what exactly the psalmist is trying to convey and how it really connects to the rest of the psalm. But you might think about it this way. When a baby or a toddler cries, what do the parents do? Parents come running. They come running. Uh, We have realized very recently now that Owen is actually a toddler who toddles around the house, we come running much faster now than we did when he was stuck and he couldn't move in his crib. Because before, when he was a baby and he cried, we knew he needed uh, perhaps a bottle or he needed to be changed or he needed a little bit of comfort. Now we know when he cries, we better get there fast because he's walking around places we don't know where he might have gotten to all of a sudden. Uh, And especially if the cry is preceded by a loud thump, right? then we know get there fast. We need to check and make sure he's okay. Uh, Well, understand verse 2 is talking about our relationship with God as his people, and the analogy is given is kind of like this. Strength has been established in the mouths of babies and infants because their cries are heard by their parents. You see, strength resides in the one who has privileged access to the one who embodies strength. And what it's saying there to us in verse 2 is that it doesn't matter how numerous our foes may be. It doesn't matter what kind of terrible circumstances we might face. It doesn't matter how very afraid we may be of what we are facing. Our God, even when we are as weak as babies and infants, our God remains infinitely strong. He is strong. And when we open up our mouths and we cry out to Him, He comes running to our rescue. True wisdom and strength come from acknowledging the majesty of the Lord. Wisdom and strength comes from crying out in prayer to the God who is strong. And yet we read this psalm and there are still so many people, even churchgoers, who would be tempted to ask the question, does God really even know about us? Maybe he knows about the big things going on in the world, but why would he ever think about Me, how could the God of the universe who made all things possibly be mindful of me? You know, I shared about Owen being a toddler now, and in two days he will be 13 months old. And so many of you all told us that the time would fly by, uh, and we believed you, we really did. I didn't have any reason not to believe you. Other people had told us that as well. But I don't think you can prepare a parent for how quickly it goes by so fast. It's just not possible. You have to experience that for yourself. We feel like just a few weeks ago, we were at the hospital. There's some mornings I wake up and Hannah has to remind me, we have a son. I say, oh, that's right. right? Yeah, yeah, Because I'm just ready to make plans. And I think, well, we can't just make plans. We've got to factor him into those plans as well. Uh, So it still seems so very new. 
Uh, but I remember being there at the hospital. There was a moment uh, where Hannah was not in the room, and I was just looking. This may have been the very next day after he was born because they kept us a night. And I was looking, and he was there in that see-through box that they put him in in, in Owensboro, I mean, just there in the room. And I just leaned over top of that box and was just staring at him. I was just leaning there because I was by myself with my son, and he was asleep. And I began to think about how good God is. And I began to ask those questions. Why would he possibly extend this kind of kindness to us? Why would he extend it to me? When I had been an atheist who wanted nothing to do with him, all of a sudden God is showing this amount of love and grace to a sinner, a wretch such as I, that I have this wonderful wife who's given us this wonderful son. And I'm looking at him and folks, I began to weep. I was by myself. I began to weep. And of course, as soon as I started, then Hannah walked back in. All right, so I was caught, and she came up, and I put my arm around her, and I just wept. I mean, there over the goodness of God's grace. Well, notice in verse 3, the psalmist says, When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, stop there for just a second. Mankind has sent satellites up into space. We've invented the best telescopes. We're constantly trying to get a view just to get a hold of what the universe is like. And we can't begin to fathom it. For God, it's nothing. It's the work of his fingers. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? The psalmist sees the testimony of God's majesty in creation. He asks the question, how could God ever care about us? We're so small. How could he notice us at all? And yet the scripture doesn't say that God notices us. It's not that God on occasion thinks, oh, that's right, I also made mankind. Let me check in and see how they're doing. No, it says very plainly he is mindful of us. He keeps us on his mind at all times. And he cares for us. He loves us. And that tells us that God loves you. That he's mindful of you. That he knows what's going on in your life. He knows your struggles. He is right there with you. With you. We live in a culture today that can't tell us why human beings should have worth or value. Our culture is so very confused and mixed up in our beliefs, we don't have a cohesive worldview. Because on the one hand, the culture will tell you, you are everything. Essentially, you're your own God. You get to make all your own decisions. You can do whatever you want to do. You can be whoever you say you are. You can feel however you want to feel, and it's all okay. But at the same time, those same voices will tell you, we're nothing more than animals. We're just a different breed of animal. We evolved up from apes from the dirt, from amoeba. That's where we came from. And those things, you're special and you're unique versus you came from animals and you're evolved, those don't go together. That's not possible. Culture can't give us any guidance in our worth. And we see that because we see how many people struggle with their worth. People who walk around depressed and anxious and fearful. People who constantly feel like they could never measure up and they wonder, why do I not have any peace in my life? Why do I not feel content? Why do I not feel like I have a purpose for being here? Church, God's word reminds us we are oh so small. We are nothing apart from God and yet God loves us. God is mindful of us. He cares for you cares for you but we hear that and the reality is we know ourselves we know how messed up we can be we know how many mistakes we can make we know our sinfulness and our failures we recognize that even in our busiest most stressful times in our lives where we feel like the whole world is riding on us at work or at school or whatever it might be if you got into a car accident that day and you were dead beyond your circle of influence the world would continue to go on just as it does Now, we are expendable, and so we think, how could it be possible that God cares for us? Why would he be mindful of us in the great scheme of things? If you go and read the book of 2 Samuel, you'll find that King David's son, Absalom, makes a terrible decision. 
he decides that he wants to be king. And this is a long decision because he begins very secretly to gain the favor of all the people of Israel. And pretty soon he stages a coup. And King David barely escapes with his life. I mean, everything is at risk here. In the grand scheme of things, this is terrible. But God preserves David because Absalom is not God's anointed king. David is. But David barely gets away with his life. He's just got a few men around him. And Absalom is determined with his men, the way to secure my kingdom is to kill my own father, King David. So that's the goal. And they are sending people after David. But David is able, because it's God's will, to rally. He's able to get his armies once again built up, and they are about to launch the counteroffensive. They're going to go get the kingdom back. And everybody knows that the only means of doing this is to kill David's greatest rival, which is Absalom. But King David gives the word, Whatever you do, do no harm to the boy Absalom. Make sure he comes home safely. Bring him back without harm to me. Now, church, that wasn't possible. In fact, Joab, the commander of the armies, he's the one who kills Absalom himself in direct defiance of King David because Absalom had to die for what had happened. Otherwise, the kingdom would never be secure. And so we know that David was a man after God's own heart, and we read that story and we wonder, why would he risk so much? Why would he risk his own life and the lives of his men and his armies? Why would he risk the kingdom of Israel, which is the kingdom of God in the grand scheme of things? It doesn't make sense. But it made sense to David because Absalom was his son. His son. And he was heartbroken when he died and he would have given up everything to trade places with him. Here's what we have to understand. Frankly, because of our egos, it's easy to think this way, but we should be surprised why this is the case. Mankind is the centerpiece of God's creation. We're not the center of the universe. God is. But we're the centerpiece of His creation, of the Creator's creation. And the reason we are at the centerpiece is because of God's divine, deliberate, and loving choice To put us there. Look again at verse 4. The psalmist says, What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Verse 5. Yet you, God, have made him, mankind, a little lower than the heavenly beings, and crowned him with glory and honor. Crowned him with glory and honor. Those are royal terms. This means you have made him a king. Verse 6. You have given him dominion, again, royal language, over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. We were made as kings and queens over this creation. Verse 7, all sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. Church, it is by God's design that mankind has dominion and stewardship and supremacy over all the rest of creation, being only a little lower than the heavenly beings. God has crowned man with glory and honor. He has given man dominion over the rest of his creation. He has put all things under mankind's feet. And what that tells us is that God absolutely notices you. He knows everything about you more than you know about yourself because you are God's precious creation. Mankind is at the center of God's creation. We're more than just animals, more than just another species. We are human beings made in the image of God. You were created to be royalty. You were created to reign over the creation as God's governor, so to speak, his vassal kings serving only the Lord. But we read that in Scripture and we think that doesn't really seem to be true, does it? Because we look around at how chaotic everything is, and we don't feel like we have any dominion at all. We can't stop earthquakes and tornadoes and hurricanes. We can barely keep ourselves from getting wet when it's raining outside. Sometimes our finances seem totally out of control, and we feel like we have no control or no dominion over it. 
the relationships in our lives can become absolutely broken, and we think there's no way we can put them back together, and sometimes we can't. We recognize that in our own physical health, we are oftentimes helpless. We all get sick, we grow old, we die, we decay, and then the worms have dominion over us. It doesn't seem like we have dominion over anything. So how can God's Word say that we were created to have it? Well, this is obviously the Old Testament, and I think the New Testament shines a light on this passage for us in Christ. Look with me to Hebrews 2, verses 5 through 8. Hebrews 2, verses 5 through 8. I'm going to read all the way through 10 eventually. It quotes Psalm 8, and it says this. Verse 5, For he, God, did not subject to angels the world to come, talking about the new creation Christ is bringing about, concerning which we are speaking. But one is testified somewhere saying, What is man that you remember him? Or the Son of Man that you are concerned about Him. You have made Him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned Him with glory and honor. You have appointed Him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under His feet. For in subjecting all things to Him, mankind, He left nothing that is not subject to Him. But now we do not yet see all things subjected to Him. The point the writer of Hebrews is making is that Currently, mankind has a very partial and imperfect dominion over creation. Meaning we are the centerpiece of creation. We're the ones who keep the world going along as it is. We make the big decisions. We know we're capable of building aquariums and zoos where we put animals there. We have dominion over them. We can build those types of tools. And yet at the same time, if I or you encountered a bear or a lion out in the wild with no weapons, we're going to get gobbled up. Right? We can't command them to do anything. And the reason we don't have this perfect dominion over creation the way God created us to have is because of our sin. Folks, humanity lives in rebellion against God. We have chosen to go our own way, and it has brought a brokenness and a corruption into God's created order. And the sad thing is there's nothing we can do to fix it, And because we've lost that dominion, we face death and decay, and we face eternity in hell separated from God forever. God made us to be crowned with glory and honor, and we threw it all away. What could possibly be done? And we see what God has done for us in Hebrews 2, verses 9 and 10. Now it's talking about Christ. But we do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus. So he became like us. He became a man like us. Because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor. That's what God made mankind for. Jesus has been crowned because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things and through whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. Church, Christ took on humanity. He condescended to us and he took on one of these broken human bodies and he lived a perfect sinless life. And we see that Jesus clearly had dominion over creation far more than we do. Because Jesus was able to speak to the storms and calm them. Jesus was able to heal the blind. He was able to heal the lame. Jesus was able to raise the dead. He walked on the water. Jesus had dominion. And then what Christ did for us was he went to the cross and he suffered and bled and died as our sacrifice, our substitute for sin, taking on God's wrath for sin. Jesus did that for us. And they buried Jesus in the tomb, and they thought he would never be back until the third day of his burial, the Father raised him from the dead. And now Jesus has become our forerunner. What Jesus has done is he has conquered death. He has exercised his dominion over death. He has been crowned with glory and honor. And what Jesus does is he brings all those who turn away from their sins and trust in him for salvation into that glory and honor again. 
He takes broken creation and He makes us new creation. And the Scripture says, in the resurrection one day, we are going to reign with Christ. And once again, we are going to have dominion with Christ over all creation. And church, all of that leads us back to praise. Psalm 8 ends the same way it begins in Psalm 8, 9. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. God is the one who has done this, not us. It's not what we accomplished. It's what Jesus finished on the cross. This is God's purpose for man, that we reign with him, made in his image. We were made to proclaim God's glory. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And our purpose for existing, our worth and our dignity and our value come from God. The Lord. So I want you to ask yourself this morning. Where is your worth coming from? I share with you where a few people get their worth. Some people get it from other people. If your worth comes from other people or even from yourself. Your worth is always going to be lacking. Lacking. Always falling short. I learned a very valuable lesson in North Carolina in my previous church. I've shared this with you before, I think. But uh, I had grown up, and anytime someone didn't like me or disagreed with me, I always found that I could charm people to where we could at least be friendly to one another. But in North Carolina, I met my match. Because there was someone there that I met who, from day one, absolutely hated my guts. And would have done anything this person could do to see me fail. Anything they could do. And folks, you need to realize there are going to be people in your life. I mean, we got to take Jesus' words seriously. He said, if they hated me, they will hate you. There are going to be people in your life who hate you. Who don't like you. Who will never like you. And if you're trying to find your worth in what other people think of you, you are always going to fall short. And let me tell you this. If you're trying to find your worth in what you think of you, you're always going to fall short as well. It breaks my heart today in our generation. This is a fairly recent thing, and it's for boys and girls, but mostly for young ladies. We are just inundated with images of these perfect Photoshopped people all the time, all the time. And young ladies begin to look at themselves, and they begin to really lose their sense of self-worth because they think, I don't look like that. But let me give you a little encouragement, or maybe it's discouragement, depending on how you look at it. Even if you're able to get yourself to the point where you think you look perfect when you look in the mirror, let me assure you that you cannot outrun time. Time. You're going to age. Your looks are going to change. And if you are trying to find value in yourself, it will not happen. When we look for value and worth in people, we're always falling short. Something else we can do when we find our worth in our enjoyment of sin, we always fall apart. Folks, you have to understand, sin is destructive. Sin ruins lives. The scripture says the wages of sin is death. And that's not just eternal hell, though it certainly is. But it's death in our souls. It's a darkness, a dark cloud that reigns over us even today when we embrace and enjoy sin. And yes, sin can be enjoyable. Sin can be very fun. Sin can be very pleasurable, but it will ruin you. Satan designed it that way so that you would want to embrace it and he could destroy you. And there's nothing in this world that will ever change that. In our culture right now, we are in the middle of an entire month where people are saying you should be proud of your sin. And church, that's just not the case. Sin destroys us. It kills us and it sends us to hell. God didn't give us the Bible to give a bunch of rules to make you miserable. He's not trying to test you and see how difficult can I make your life. These aren't arbitrary things that we have to live by. No, God designed you in his image. He made you for life and abundant life in Christ. And the thing is, we are the ones who are caught in sin. The Bible shares with us what sin is so that we can be free from it. 
so that we can live as God intended us to live and we can find our contentment in his purpose for our lives. When your worth comes from people, whether it's others or yourself, you're always falling short. When your worth comes from your enjoyment of sin, you are always falling apart. But when your worth comes from your status and your purpose in Christ, you will always be content. When your worth is found in Jesus, you will always be content. You will always feel worthy, and it won't be because of your efforts or the things that you've accomplished or the things that you've done. No, it's all because of what Christ has done for us. God made us to reign with him in his image. He gave us royalty. You are his blessed and beloved creation. And even though you and I have been born into sin and we have ruined all of that, God in his grace has provided us a way of rescue in Jesus Christ. We can establish that strength. We can be found in glory and honor, not because of who we are, but because of who Jesus is. Ask yourself this morning, where does your worth come from? If it's not coming from Christ, you're going to be a broken person. But you can find it in Jesus today by turning away from a life of sin, believing on the Savior, following him. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, God, we thank you so much for the grace that you've given us through our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. And God, we thank you that even though we can be so unsure of ourselves in this world and in this life, even though our circumstances can be so frightening and challenging, even though we can look in the mirror and be so very disappointed in ourselves, even though we can be so unworthy, Lord, you have given us worth in Jesus. And God, I pray this morning that every single person here would be able to leave here today knowing that worth and that dignity of being your child. So God, we pray that you would rescue us this morning. Father, I pray that if there be anyone here who's never received Jesus as their Lord and Savior, that you would convict them of their sins and draw them to your Son. Lord, for those of us who have professed faith in Christ and we are seeking to follow Jesus, but we do so imperfectly, Lord, help us to come to you for grace every day. And Lord, if we are racked with guilt and with shame because of our sin, help us to find freedom and life and worth this morning in Jesus. God, draw your people to yourself. And we pray all these things in Jesus, the King of Kings' name. Amen.